Working Cows Podcast, episode 149. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. And we're still here. Uh, I'm still around. Sorry, I just kind of pod faded there for a second, but uh, we'll be we'll be producing content regularly again. Had a very busy month of July at uh, Bible Camp that I help with, and uh, had a had a great great month there. Uh, the last last week that I help with had a couple of kids or uh, about eight kids. Uh, stand up to say that they wanted to uh, bow the knee to Jesus as Lord and, and to follow Him with their life. So it was it was a great opportunity. Uh, appreciate your patience in the intervening weeks with less regular content, but we've got some great stuff coming up for you, and I'm really excited to get that out to you in the near future. And really excited to be joined today by Ryan Noble, and Ryan has in his plans to uh, attend the uh, regenerative grazing workshop at Derek Schwanebeck's place, August 25th through the 27th. So uh, if you're interested in attending that, I would encourage you to uh, make plans to be there. A uh, really neat opportunity there to be on that place uh, that's been managed uh, regeneratively for a number of years and be there with uh, Derek Schwanebeck, a multi-time guest of the Working Cows podcast and Jim Garrish, also a multi-time guest uh, of the Working Cows podcast. So pretty, pretty neat opportunity uh, coming up for uh, those of you who are interested in attending, and that will be August 25th through the 27th. So uh, make sure you check out workingcows.net slash 149 for the show notes page and for uh, a flyer there that you has the contact information where you can go and get signed up to be there. Really look forward to seeing uh, Ryan there. And Ryan was suggested as a guest by Derek Schwanebeck to talk about how he is managing through a drought. So we're going to talk to Ryan about his current situation and what he's been doing to uh, make sure that he remains uh profitable and in the business of ranching through these challenging times that he's been in. So, Ryan, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. You bet. It's my pleasure, Clay. Love love your show. I'm honored to have a chance to sit down and visit with you for a little bit. Yeah, well, I uh, was talking to Derek Schwanebeck about the grazing school coming up at his place, and, and he said that he had recently talked to you and, and that you were... Uh, dealing with some some dry conditions and that uh, he thought you'd be a, a great uh, guy to talk to about how you've been handling that. So could you tell me a little bit about the the recent conditions and kind of what's what's average or normal? And I know Brian Alexander says uh, that's just a setting on a dryer, but uh, what uh, what is what is kind of what can you generally expect and what have you been dealing with in the recent past? Sure. Well, we're out here in uh, eastern Colorado in, in Yuma County, and uh, our normal rainfall, according to the FSA, is from 16 to 18 inches a year. Uh, most of that comes April, May, June, and July for the most part. You know, we'll we'll catch a few snows here and there, but pretty much historically the winters are really dry, which leads to good grazing. And uh, in the spring and March, about the time everybody starts calving, usually the storms start to fire up and, and, uh, you know, pretty notorious for getting two to three day blizzards with the Albuquerque low comes through the panhandle of Oklahoma and we'll get upslope for three days and not uncommon to get one to two feet of snow with 40, 50 mile an hour wind. And, and, uh, but it's really good moisture. And that usually kind of sets the stage for how our, how our spring and summer grazing goes to anyhow looking I was just looking at my records a couple of days ago and uh I keep very meticulous precipitation records. If it's over five hundredths, I will write it down. 
and uh, <laughs> starting the the end of June 2018, it just kind of quit right here on our ranch. And since then, we've had about 60% of normal precipitation. So we are about 15 inches short in the last 25 months, which is huge. It's just unbelievable how dry we are. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's tough. What has been uh, some of the strategies that you've been employing um, to to continue to operate on your ranch through this through these challenging times? Right. Uh, so, like I said, one of the the biggest tools that I've I've implemented is uh, we try to get twenty grazing days per acre, and that lines out to about one point one grazing days per standard animal unit per inch of rainfall. So obviously the more rain we get, the more grazing days we'll have av- available and the less rainfall we have, the less grazing days we'll have, but we can really kind of pinpoint exactly how much forage is available out there. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that really has done a good, good job for us. It's served us really well because we can kind of nail down a tight number rather than a, an emotional number. You know, some guys are like, oh, it's it's dry or, oh, it's wet. But is it really? Is it just a three-week trend and and your dog got ran over so you're not feeling good anyhow? Or is it really dry or is it really wet? But we try to just take the emotion out of it and make it a, make it a you know, an on-paper, on-purpose kind of a decision as to how much feed we think we have. So, and uh, one of the biggest things we have is a drought plan. And, you know, they say in war making a plan is a, or uh, yeah, having a plan is absolutely worthless, but making the plan is absolutely invaluable. Hmm. And that's kind of, kind of where we're at on that too. We'll, we'll have a, a plan that uh, starts out, you know, what if it's dry the, the next 30 days, hundred days, you know, year, two years. Uh, we sat down a year ago, 2018, we got by okay because we had adequate subsoil moisture we had good topsoil moisture and we had a lot of feed whereas in 2019 was the driest april we'd had in years and then may was just right at average and then it just absolutely quit the end of may and we had a really late freeze we had six to ten inches of snow the last week in may and it froze we needed Mm. the moisture but also the freeze set us back sure and then it just absolutely quit so that's when we started having issues as far as limiting in uh, feed growth just because of the timing of everything. So our uh, grazing days per inch of rainfall and our, our drought plan are just paramount for for helping us navigate these pretty tough days. So Sure. So the great philosopher Mike Tyson said that the everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And uh, so, right. I mean... Uh, you talk about emotional decisions. You talk about on purpose, on paper. Uh, how have you been able to execute? And I, I don't know if I can use the plan uh, or use the word stay stay profitable through these times, but but stay in the business uh, at, so that when when better times do come, you're still there uh, with with uh, pastures that are in good enough shape to to be able to go right back to. Uh, kind of ramping up and and stocking at a at a level that will allow you to be profitable. Uh, can you talk about how you sure. how you've handled some of those things? So, so a year ago, you know, we uh, we were looking at the short term outlooks. We were looking at long term, and I'm not trying to be a whiner, but everybody everybody within radio listening area had a pretty dang good summer last year. Uh, my friends in the Sandhills, Nebraska were just, they were ready for the rain to quit. Mm-hmm. Uh, people down South had a, had a great summer, you know, just all the way around us, it rained and we, I called it the eye of the dry. It was so mm. small of an area. We were about 20 miles North to South and 60 miles East and West, but our, our whole ranch was inside that window where it just would not rain every day. It, I, I swear it started when the polar vortex storm in the middle of March that thing camped right over the top of us and it seemed like the red weather pattern never moved all summer but it it would just rain all the way around us all summer long and people people 20 miles from us had 
30 plus inches of moisture last summer and wow. we had about three. Hmm. So, uh, so I, what ended up happening was June was in April was incredibly dry. June was incredibly dry. July turned out really hot. And then we had a grasshopper problem. Uh, we rotationally graze with large groups of cattle and, and we left grass in May that was six to eight inches tall after we grazed it in July, coming around a 50 to 60 day rest. This grass is three inches tall, brown, mm. and the grasshoppers were just unbelievable. And right there, I'm like, we've got to, we've got to change course today. Uh, so that's when we really started hitting the drought plan a lot harder. So the first thing we did was wean calves the 1st of August. You know, when, mm-hmm. when you wean a calf off a cow, her requirements go down about 30%. Uh, the next thing we did was any cows over nine years old, we, uh, we sent them to town as slaughter cows, but, the, but they, they weighed up at about 900, 950 bucks. We kind of wrestled with that decision because those cows had some life left in them. Mm. But, you know, by December, a short term weigh cow was only bringing $650, $700. So A, we didn't have to feed her and B, we got a lot more money out of that. So, so that was one thing that really helped us a lot. Do you think that you were still uh, able to hit that kind of uh, summer hamburger market? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, or, yeah. Yes. Yep. 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 You know, you look at cattle facts, you look at anybody and they'll just flat tell you best time of year to sell a cow is in July or August. And the next best time is out in the middle of February sometime. You know, you sell a cow in October, November, she's just not going to bring a lot of money. So as far as cold cows go. So but anyhow, so we weaned the calves. Uh, we we had already pulled the bulls on the breeding breeding heifers, and we just left them in the bulls in for one uh, cleanup cycle instead of two. And then uh, we sold the older cows, and that helped a lot. We just stock, we destocked about thirty five forty percent right there. And then the next thing we did is we found some some people that would take some bred heifers in August and September instead of waiting till historical, you know, November, or December. So, so we ended up destocking about 50% between August and September. And what that did for us was saved about a third of our grass that, and that helped it to only be grazed one time last summer instead of two to three times. So feed wise, it didn't save a lot of feed because we didn't grow a lot of feed, but ecologically we put that grass to to bed in really good shape mm-hmm. because the roots the roots weren't ever shocked by a heavy grazing period with no no moisture to rebuild and regrow and and kind of recoup from from the dry weather uh, and then uh, the final thing we did was about the middle of August when the dust had settled from weaning calves and shipping opens and all that kind of stuff I called everybody into the office made a great big pot of iced tea locked the doors and I said we are not leaving until we have a plan that will run this ranch, pay all the bills, keep the employees in place, you know, make a return on investment without turning one head out on native range. We're going to go nuclear and start working our way backwards. Hmm. And uh, we were in there about five or six hours, you know, six or seven people all thinking on the same page. And and what we came up with is uh, we can do it but we just can't do it with, with uh, mother cows. We got to have yearlings in here. So phase one of our, our drought plan was we need to liquidate half of the breeding cows. So that's what we started doing in October. We, we had finished preg checking and I listed the three, four and five year old cows for sale. And, you know, my neighbors thought I was nuts. That's, that's your, that's your meat and potatoes. That's mm. the factory. What on earth are you doing selling them? I'm like, well, we're in a, we're in a drought. Oh yeah, but it's going to rain. I said, well, fantastic. I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready for it to start raining. <laughs> but, but for our ranch, this is what we need to do. Uh, we have a thousand head grow yard and we don't farm. We buy all our feed. So, I mean, it's very realistic as to what we pay feed. There's no supplementing our cattle with, with a home raised feed or anything like that. But, uh, when we ran through our gross margins and all of our worry areas which were you know labor and quality of life and and you know just how how will cattle perform at a bunk 
when it's 105 degrees compared mm-hmm. to a compared to a cow calf unit, then we just decided we needed to we needed to to uh, downsize the cow herd and and run more heifer calves. And uh, so that's what we did last fall. And then our our critical drop dead date was April 15th. You know, if we didn't have at least 100% of normal moisture in March and 100% of normal in April, we needed to be ready to make changes. And uh, I started looking at the short-term forecast, started looking at the long-term forecast. And by the by the first or second week in March, I'm like, guys, it, it ain't going to rain in April at all. So, you know, last fall, thinking of getting rid of the, the rest of the cows, the two and two and three-year-old pairs was excruciating. But by... But by uh, this spring, we had no grass on hand and no prospects for real moisture. We were just in big trouble. So we decided to go ahead and liquidate all the two and three year old pairs. And luckily, we got to, got to work on that before the COVID hmm. really got a hold of the female market. So so that was good too. So it was it was pretty tough taking those cattle that I've been. <clears throat> You know, that was the product of 20 years of of uh, focused, intense breeding to get that cow herd mm-hmm. to the elite status that they were. But they got on a truck and left. My neighbors really thought I was nuts when that happened. <laughs> and But now, you know, 60, 90 days later, it's one of the best things we ever did. We sold them, mm-hmm. sold them for great money, went to good homes, and, and just one less thing to worry about. That's kind of the 10-month story of our drought plan. What elements do you think... Uh, make a good drought plan what are some of the things that should be there uh and then how yeah how do you execute thanks sure i think a lot of it's emotional and a lot of it's physical so i mean the the physical part of the plan is is you know what what's your current situation and that's that's kind of threefold what's your available forage what's your topsoil moisture what's your subsoil moisture you know in in our neck of the woods with limited rainfall there's times we'll have amazing forage, but it's pretty dry. There's other times we won't have a lot of forage, but we got subsoil moisture and topsoil moisture. So, I mean, if you can hit two out of those three, you're probably going to be in good shape. But the trend that started scaring me was we were heading towards zero on all three counts. And we like to be on a scale of one to 10, we like to be five to, you know, five or above on all three accounts to be normal. So that's what really started, uh, making me worry and then uh so that's what you actually have on hand and then then you got to look at the forecast and you got to look what's going to happen not only uh, moisture but temperature for the next 14 days next 30 days and next 90 days you know the forecast isn't always right which we found out last summer you know called much above normal precipitation Mm -hmm. all summer long and we were incredibly dry but it was just a tiny little spot it's just kind of like if the first three are less than five and then the next three, the, the outlooks are terrible. Yeah. You're probably, you're probably in for some rough sledding, but if you're average on the top side and hopefully you got above average coming your way, you'll probably, probably got a pretty good chance of making it through. But one of my favorite sayings is drought begins the day after it rains. <laughs> and it sounds kind of crazy, but honestly it's, it does. The, the day after it rains, we all take a big breath and a smile on your face and kick around in your bog boots, your muck boots for a couple of days. But, <laughs> you know, the, the clock starts ticking again until the next rain happens to get here. That's kind of the physical part of the drought plan. The, the emotional part of the drought plan, in my opinion, is have you been there before? Can you live with it? Uh, are you the type of person that can feed cows all summer and be happy about it? Or are you going to have an ulcer and a aneurysm before this thing's over? Uh, can you see your cattle? Maybe not in the kind of condition you want them to be in. And also, what's it going to do to your bottom line? You know, for example, we we sold our cows at a in a really good market because drought wasn't on anybody's radar at that time. And now we're also in a position to where we'll be able to buy some cattle back that are probably it'll probably be advantageous for us because these people are drought stressed and they don't have a lot of options. They can't afford to feed them. So they got to line them up and sell them. Right. Uh, so, so I think the emotional part is 
just as big or bigger, you know, people just keep hoping that it's going to rain and it can, it absolutely can. It can rain anytime, but you know, going back to my trend conversation, one rain usually doesn't make a whole summer. It needs to be a wetter pattern, not just, not just a rain or two to get you by. Right. Uh, you talk about Mardic marketing or you talk about monitoring, sorry, you talk about monitoring, uh, topsoil moisture, subsoil moisture. Um, you talk about keeping rainfall records, uh, some of those things. Uh, how, how are you doing that? What have you found to be some helpful tools uh, in, in those regards? Uh, what are you doing to make sure that you've got the records you need to make sure that your drought plan is as informed as it can be? Sure. You know, it, it's not very scientific at all. I have a, a big poster board with, with every rainfall event for the last nine or 10 years on it. So I can see the trends as far as, you know, I can look back a month, I can look back six months, or I can look back a year. So that's not very sophisticated. It's just a handwritten log. And and uh, then I also, the available forage, topsoil moisture, subsoil moisture, I just keep that on a piece of uh, printer paper. And I'll just try to sit down once a month and and uh, fill it in. So it's not scientific. It's just, hey, it's, it's pretty darn wet or, man, it's really dry. And then uh, subsoil moisture, you know, I'll ask the crew, did you dig any post holes today? Yep. Is it wet? Absolutely. Good to the bottom. Or heck no, it's it's dry as a bone. But I I kind of know that just through my rainfall record. And then, uh, and then at the bottom, I'll just say, you know, are we moving to a wetter period or are we moving to a neutral or a dry? So all that's just on a little piece of paper and I try to fill it out once a month. But, you know, in 2018 in June, we were eight, nines and tens across the board. Mm. It looked like we were just set up to roll. And then a year ago in June, we didn't have a five on the board. Mm. And right now we don't, we don't have, we got like a couple of twos and a whole bunch of zeros. So, so it's not very scientific at all. It's not, the spreadsheet is just handwritten observations because it has, doesn't have to be incredibly accurate. It just has to, has to show, Hey, here's where we were a year ago. Here's where we were six months ago. Here's where we were at last month wow, we, things have changed. So, mm. and it just kind of solidifies what everybody sees out on the ranch every day anyhow, mm-hmm. but it can sure, sure give you some peace of mind that that's, that's what you are seeing. So how does grazing change through a drought? What are you doing different? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, I'm a, I mean, I love my cows, but I am a, I'm a land guy. I'm a, <laughs> you know, on this ranch, I'm a, fourth generation through one grandpa grandfather and fifth generation through another grandfather. So, you know, we've been here on this piece of property since 1910 and, uh, it took me a long time to figure this out, but everything on the hoof out there honestly is going to be gone in 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. But this land hopefully is going to be here for another five or 10 generations. So we gotta, we gotta take care of our land. You know, the drier it is, the longer this stuff needs to rest. Right now, because we planned it out a year ago, we are stocked at about 75-80% of normal, but everything we're grazing now is going to get grazed two or three days, probably not going to return unless we get a real substantial rainfall, but it's all had a, at least a one-year rest. And every time we go out, we're just pleased at how good this grass looks for no more rain than we've had. So it it just is amazing. But you think about it, you know, this country is probably droughty 30 to 60% of the time. This grass was, was, uh, developed through time and time and trials to, to withstand this kind of stuff. But mm. what it can't stand is just constant grazing pressure. It just mm. needs a rest. And, and, you know, grazing, grazing is a function of rest. You can, you can beat up some land. As long as you give it a rest, it'll be just fine. I think I think where people get in trouble is they get out there too early, they take too much, and they come back too quick. And mm-hmm. that's when long-term damage is, is uh, going to show up. But we, we rode across some pasture this morning, hasn't been grazed since June of 2019. And honest to Pete, 
if we could get an inch and a half of rain, our, our warm seasons would go crazy. Hmm. It just absolutely crazy. It's there. It's green. It's not very big, but if it would, if it, if we could get any kind of moisture event, it would explode. Hmm. You know, so some of the traditional set stock grazing across the highway down the street, I don't think it matters if it had 10 inches of rain on it. I don't know if it'd grow this year because it's just, it's just done. Hmm. It's had it. It's just gone dormant. Are the paddocks that you're grazing through mostly permanent infrastructure? Most of our paddocks are just uh, single hot wire. Uh, for us, they're they're about 40 inches off the ground. Works really good for us for uh, cow calf pairs. Works fantastic for yearlings. Uh, nothing too exciting. Just a high tensile wire with a with a piece of two and seven eight inch pipe drove in the ground five foot for our corners and and a tensioner and a spring and mm-hmm. and away we go most of our paddocks are from probably the smallest ones are about 30 acres on some uh on some old farm ground that's that's planted back to non-native species up to most of our most of our native range is about 100 to 120 acre paddocks we've we've talked about during the drought we if we would set up to put in and take out you know, a quarter to half a mile of poly wire, we could split all those. We could double our paddocks really easy. And probably instead of grazing it for two days, we could probably graze a day and a half on the front side and a day and a half on the back side and get an extra day, an extra 30% without really hurting anything. Sure. And so. yeah, that, that was kind of my question. I was wondering if there was ever any effort to increase density or, or, um, slow down the rotation, so to speak, uh, in through the, through the drought. But I, I guess yep. in your, in your situation, the strategy is not to come back a second time. Is that right? Yep. Yep. We're not planning on coming back a second time. And, you know, just to the topography this year, we had a terrible freeze, the, uh, tail end of April, the grass was trying to green up and, you know, is it, it really damaging to the, to the cereal grain crops around and the grass, it just, it mm-hmm. just really hurt it. So our, our flats look pretty terrible. You know, the wheat grasses probably never got over three, four inches tall. Uh, dang sure didn't have a chance to head out, mm-hmm. but the hills, the hills look pretty good. You know, the, the uh, needle and thread did okay. Of course, cheat grass had a banner year <laughs> because we weren't out grazing early. Uh, and the warm seasons are, are hanging right in there in the hills just because I think it was protected from frost and probably caught just a little bit more of the little bit of snow that we had. So it's it's kind of the opposite. Usually our flats are really productive and our hills are not quite as, but this year it's kind of the kind of the inverse of that, which is pretty interesting to observe. And we are talking in the the middle of July. Uh, this will be released, Lord willing, later this week. Uh, so I'll be uh-huh. I'll be putting this out later this week. So it's right in the middle of Ju- July when we're talking is basically when you're gonna you're gonna hear this episode. So uh, kind of give you a little bit more of the context of the date and where we're at uh, in in these kinds of things. Um, and we we've, sure. we've talked about how your marketing has changed um and what triggers uh your marketing decisions is there anything else you want to say about that or any any more you want to add to to the marketing side of this oh yeah the the marketing side you know we we went through almost an identical situation in 2011 and 12 uh just had a terrible year in 2011 felt kind of picked on cuz like we had a dome over the this half of the county, it just wouldn't rain. And, and so we were pretty, pretty wired in as to, as to how dry it was. And then along came 2012 and, you know, everybody west of the Mississippi and maybe even further east of the, than that was really affected by the drought of 2012. So, hmm. so we, we were pretty fine tuned living through that experience. And, and, uh, you know, come a, come a drought situation, you need, you need to have a plan and you need to be one of the first guys to market because when everybody else decides to market, it's, it's going to, you know, the local cash basis is going to be pretty poor and, and it's going to be a buyer's market, not a seller's market. So, uh, you know, and we try to, we try to have a third to a half of our herd identified as, you know, these, these will be the cattle that go first. If it starts getting dry, if it's 20% dry, 
these 20% are the 20% that need to go hmm. or we need to wean the calves. That would save about 30% of the feed. Maybe we only leave the bulls in for, you know, 25 days instead of 40 or on the cow herd, maybe, maybe it's a 45 day deal instead of a 60 day deal. And also one of the things we've gone to doing is, uh, ultrasounding because these vets are pretty darn accurate at, <laughs> you know, 28, 29, 30 days bred. So, you know, if you kick bulls out the 1st of May, pull them the 15th of June, 15th of July, those cold cows can be gone. Hmm. And if you, if you wean the, wean the middle of July and sell your, you know, eight to eight to 10% open cows, whatever it is on your ranch, plus maybe some old cows, you're going to hit the top of the market and just get rid of that many more mouths to feed. So, uh, you know, so one of the things we've done different than in 2012 is we got a lot more yearlings because they're very flexible. They can go to town just about any day of the week and they're, and they're pretty liquid. You know, a, a cow is worth a lot of money at certain times of year, but a, if you're in the wrong time of the year, she's, she's almost a liability, not an asset. <laughs> you know, you're just, you're just going to weigh her up and see you later, sister. And that's, that's painful. Hmm. You know, you just you lose a lot of equity when you weigh a cow up. Whereas a yearling, you know, hopefully you're adding value to those cattle every day of the week. And the day you decide to sell them, you capture that value and, and go on. Uh, another thing we've, we've done differently as far as marketing is, you know, we bring some custom cattle in to uh, custom breed for some people and custom graze them right after that. Also, all of our, uh, our land leases have drought clauses in them now, you know to protect the landowner and to protect us because if we pay a whole year's whole year's uh, lease we need a whole year's grazing hmm. if you're 50% short on rainfall who's going to who's going to who's going to be short and that needs to be identified when you sign that lease up but uh, our experience has been the landowners absolutely want their land taken care of and they understand that we're going to graze every day possible but we're also going to draw a line as to how how much fodder we're going to remove from that land, and they're happy to to uh, kind of set a baseline that this is what we're going to graze and this is what we're going to pay, and if something changes, we're going to be in contact, and that's going to be renegotiated because you know obviously if there's only a third as much feed as normal, we gotta we gotta cut way back on numbers, and so that's been pretty helpful too, and really builds for long-term relationships because nobody feels like they got the short end of the stick. Is it looking like you're going to be able to go to the regenerative grazing workshop at Derek's place? Yes. Yep. I sent my, uh, I sent my deposit in the other day. I'm super excited. Uh, you know, and there you go once again, uh, you know, on this ranch in a normal year, we'll have about 350, 400,000 grazing days during the summer, you know, on native pasture and then, you know, another 150, 200,000 out on uh, crop residue. And, you know, so for me, that's, that's pretty important. If I can pick up one little deal where I could move the needle, even a nickel a day, you know, this is tens of thousands of dollars worth of grazing that I could, I could capture just by going and spend a little time and, and learning some things. You know, it's it's a commitment to leave the ranch for three days, but I'm telling you, seven seven hundred dollars or whatever it is looks really cheap compared to the amount of uh, grazing that we do around here. We we don't have to uh, change things very much to capture our seven hundred bucks. Yeah, no, it sounds like good good opportunity. I'm looking forward to being there uh, again, a place that's been managed using a lot of these principles for quite a while, and and to see to have Jim Garrish there as well as Derek, the manager there to, to point it out. It looks like a pretty good opportunity. So if people want more information on that, they can go to the show notes page for today at workingcows.net slash 149, workingcows.net slash 149. There'll be a link there or a, at least a flyer there with some information that you can check it out and get in touch with Derek and, and uh, let him know that you'd like to come as well. So uh, I guess I, I wanted to uh, move on to some other some other questions. I had some questions come in from my private Facebook group, and uh, also uh, wanted to ask you some some other questions I had written down here. 
as well. But uh, Brian Alexander wanted to know how did you determine your critical dates? And you've mentioned uh, some of the some of the different forecasting uh, agencies out there. Are there other other things that go into that? You've talked about available forage, topsoil moisture, subsoil moisture. Are, are there other other things that go into that? Uh, along with that, those forecasting agencies predictions. Yeah. So, so in Eastern Colorado, uh, you know, our historical last freeze is about the first week in May. So that's when things really start to warm it up and, and start to roll. And, uh, you know, usually the second, third week in April, you know, the cows can be grazing. Hopefully we got some stockpiled forage and some new, new, uh, cool seasons coming up through there. So it's a pretty good ration. So what I did is I sat down and, and I look and, uh, so from the 15th of April through about, you know, the first of July, we grow 85 to 90% of our forage. So if we're dry during that period, it's kind of a double whammy. That's when all our growth occurs and if we don't have any, any moisture to, to grow it with. We're kind of in trouble. I mean, we, we appreciate fall rains, but you know, a couple, two or three inches in May is gold, whereas a couple, two or three inches in September really doesn't help us until the following growing season. Hmm. And then the the second part of that trigger of a, of our April 15th was, you know, when do people buy cow-calf pairs? And our thoughts were by the 10th of May, it's kind of winding down. So, you know, the most active period we thought was probably April. April is probably the time to try to sell a pair. You might be able to get a few after the first or second week in May, but pretty much anybody in our in our area that's wanting to buy pairs is already going to be have them bought. So we kind of put the uh, average rainfall as the best in April, May, June, July. The growth of the of the native grass comes April, May, June, and the best marketing time is probably April. So that's how we kind of hmm. narrowed it down to April 15th. You know, we, we kind of took it all all into account and said, you know, April is kind of our deal because even if we held them till 10th of June, it might rain. We might have some grass, but if we still wanted to market them, that window is kind of closed. Or if we do get some rain, but the temperature is wrong, the grass is not going to grow. So, you know, it, it just it just made a lot of sense to our group that, April 15th was a very critical date to, to move the pairs. And if you, and if you do market them April 15th and then it turns off wet, you've got that economic, uh, cash sitting there that you can come back and, and restock with, with things, uh, later as well, or, or wait, wait until, you know, the market's right and then do it. Yes, absolutely. Cause you know, seven out of 10 years, somebody needs grass the first of July or the first of August because they've been droughted out. Look what's going on right now. We're second, third week in July. There's plenty of people would love to have a place to go with cows. So, so that was another, another part of the plan was, well, we sell the cows April 15th, turns off really wet by the first of August, we could take in quite a few custom cattle for 90 or hundred days and, and graze that grass. And that would be a win as well. So it's kind of the practical triple bottom line. Uh, this is this is how those things f- get fleshed out. Is uh, we love our our grass more than our cows, and we can always replace cows, but we can't always replace root reserves, or can't replace root reserves near as quickly as we can uh, as we can cattle. Absolutely, absolutely. You know that's that's great. So another another one. Um, was the percentage of desocking kind of based on a percentage of the of the moisture that you had and kind of that that uh, zero to ten scale and how far are we above a five or how far are we below a five? That's kind of how the percentages of those numbers uh, and the relationships of those numbers is kind of how you des- decide what percentage to de- destock at. Yep. So our our other thing was we know we have a lot of flexibility in our grow yard, so. We can breed cattle in there and go to grass. We can breed cattle in there, leave the cleanup bull in, go to grass. We can go clear through ultrasound in the grow yard and then go to grass. I mean, 
the turnout data from the grow yard has a has a lot of variability to it, whereas these cows economically need to be grazing. And the other side was, at what point do we just want to exit the cow business? You know, is it 200 head? Is it 85 head? Is it 25 head? Where is it? And we decided that unless we had in the neighborhood of 200 head of cows, we probably would be better off to uh, go ahead and liquidate them. So that was kind of that was kind of where we were at. Is like, well, we've got 200 pairs here. We could have kept the heifer pairs and sold the steer pairs, kept our genetics together, but we just didn't feel like we could graze them the way we wanted to with a hundred pairs and we would have difficulty commingling uh, yearlings and cow calf pairs that time of year. So that was one of the things we probably sold more cattle than we should have, but we just, honestly, we just didn't want to mess around with running 40 or 60 pairs. We wanted to have 200 pairs or we didn't want to have any cows. So, so we didn't go exactly to the line, but, we just liquidated what was rest left because we didn't didn't want to mess around with a handful of cows just for grazing purposes and stuff. We're just set up to run bigger groups and and spin them through there quicker. Sure. And how much of that not wanting to run less than two hundred pairs is the ability to market and load lots? Absolutely. I mean, it's there's there's plenty of people out there that'd be happy to buy you know five, ten, fifteen pairs from you. And honestly, we we can sell those for a little bit more, but it takes just as much time to get the health papers and the <laughs> veterinary inspection and and get them all sorted up to do 10 pairs as it does to do two semi loads. So it's, yeah, load lots are pretty easy to sell. Honestly, they're about as, about as much hassle as selling five or 10 head, but, yeah. but we do sell, we do sell in smaller bunches. We'll do it. <laughs> do you think it's wise to keep grass and feed inventory even when you're not facing dry weather? Do you guys have a practice of Oh Go ahead. Yeah. That 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 was another thing uh so for our cattle I usually have 40 to 60 days of stockpiled forage in front of our pairs because the most expensive time for us on several factors in the cow herd is is in the spring, you know. Labor is always short in the spring. Uh, those once again, those cows need to be outside, spread out from each other. You know, self quarantining, six foot rule. It, it works with these calves too. Social distancing is great for cow calf pairs. They <laughs> they need to be turned out. They need to be away from each other. We calve our cows up tight, close to the house, and then immediately get them off grazing, turned out. But but our health is superior. The performance is fantastic. Uh, we can keep our groups together. You know, a lot of times these grazing groups will have calves, you know, we'll have two, two to 300 in a group, but they were born within 12 to 20 days from each other. So, you know, the isolation and the, and the grouping helps out with the herd health a lot. So yeah, it's, uh, that, that's why we try to have 40, 60 days of grass ahead of us. So I don't have to, pack every ounce of feed to those cows that they need they can be spread out and they do really well and after last last summer i didn't have anywhere to go i mean i had nowhere to, that i wouldn't have had to supplement them very hard plus they would have grazed the grass shorter than i wanted at that time of year so that was another trigger too is we just don't have anywhere to to land these cows after they calve because i'm i'm pretty big on putting them on optimal forage that's been well rested and and then uh, that just works pretty good for us. Um, so I got a couple of questions here that are similar, I guess. Uh, how do you determine when to restock? Um, how And we've talked about this a little bit, but how do you balance marketing strategy into a drought plan? For example, destocking before everyone else to take advantage of up markets so you can restock before everyone else to take advantage of the down markets. So... Uh, some of those, some of those ideas. How are you thinking about those things? What are you thinking about uh, going forward? Uh, will you restock with pairs? Or are you guys out of that for now? Or what are you thinking? Well, that's a that's a fantastic question, and and uh, I honestly am not going to give you a very clear answer on that because right now we're looking at 
at uh, La Nina kicking in, and we might be facing another year of this. We have no clue, or it could start raining tomorrow. Uh, so I think what it, for me it's going to be what's what's the inventory of grass look like? How many animal units do we think we can we can uh, support in the next season? And what do our resources look like this winter? Uh, you know, some of the resources that we do have, we have, we lease about 2,500 acres of crop after feed and we have the grow yard. So there's considerable amount of grazing in the winter. And of course the grow yards usually got some margin in it that we can, uh, that we can capture. But what took me so long to figure out, you know, when I first got in a ranching deal, when I got out of college was I swung for the fence and we'd either hit a home run or we'd strike out hmm. and nothing cooler than hitting a home run and nothing more <laughs> painful than striking out. And that's just how I operated for a while, you know, 20 years old and trying to, trying to make a mark and get going here. But what took me a while to learn was, uh, you gotta have a, you gotta kind of have a, a five fold plan here and, Plan A is we make a ton of money and plan B is we make pretty good money and plan C is we do all right and and D is we make a little money and E is we break even and the very worst one is F <laughs> and we lost three bucks a head and it was worth it to be in the game. So that's that's how we try to plan everything around here is mitigate loss, you know, try to have margin in everything and that keeps us so fluid and so so uh, manageable, you know, if we just kind of play the what if game, well, what if we lay in a bunch of calves this fall, get them weaned up, you know, and there's a hundred dollar profit to be taken to turn out for other people to graze them. Do we take it or do we graze them on our own land or do we breed the heifers or do we send them to the feedlot or, you know, and, and we tried to build this thing where any one of these will make sense. And we also, we also like to hedge, you know, I'm a, I'm an options kind of guy. If, if I can lock up a hundred dollar profit on something, a floor, we'll go ahead and spend that money and, and go to the board and, <clears throat> and, uh, get that profit locked up. And with the options, you know, if it goes on up, that's great. We'll capture that too, but at least, at least we got a floor that'll pay the bills and keep the lights on. You know, I guess, I guess our advantage is, with our almost guaranteed winter feed crop, we can kind of stock through the winter up to capacity and then start laying cattle off throughout the spring and summer as needed per rainfall or moisture events. You know, today we're looking at, at, uh, you know, what are we going to stock this place with? And it's probably going to be heifer calves and, you know, it, it might be heifer calves, from southwest Kansas, southern Colorado, Panhandle of Oklahoma, and the Panhandle of Texas, because they're in extreme drought right now. Uh, I've heard, you know, northern part of Wyoming, parts of South Dakota, parts of North Dakota are pretty dry. Mm-hmm. You know, so there will there will be some people that need to do uh, ship some calves early, and and maybe we can find some of those people and be a win win for everybody. We could maybe we could hold their genetics together for them and give them a chance to buy some of those back a year from now or, you know, 15 months. And in the meantime, we could run some really nice, nice cattle down on this place. But, uh, so that's kind of one of the, it's a challenge to figure out a when and what we're going to do. Cause, uh, it's going to be, you know, you don't know what, when the top is in until <laughs> four months after the top was in and you don't know when the bottom is in until, mm-hmm somebody somebody puts the graph you know in publication six months later yep there was the bottom well <laughs> you don't you don't really know that the day of so you just gotta roll with it and hope you're trending in the right direction yeah and know so, and and know your numbers you know understand right what you can make money doing and and not not worry too much about missing it by a couple of days one way or the other or a month whatever right absolutely absolutely and and you know uh we're gonna have a lot of bred heifers coming up here too and yeah it'd be nice to just 
have them all gone one day, like, like feeder cattle, but, but, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to try to move some early. They'll be priced right and priced accordingly, you know, to leave in August with 60 to 90 day embryos in them. And there'll be some room for some other people to do well with that. But some of these heifers, I would guess, will probably, uh, hold till the first of the year and, uh, try to catch some, some premiums as far as bred heifers. And then I imagine we'll calve some out. And then we'll have some options next spring. We can we can turn out pairs or we can sell pairs and and uh I guess that's that's a lot of it's just not being set in stone, you know. This is how grandpa did it, so this <laughs> is what we're gonna do. Well, you, you just gotta be just gotta be pretty flexible. You know, we we see more market moves in a ten day period than grandpa saw in <laughs> in five year periods. So <laughs> you just gotta be cognizant of it and and uh ready to react. You got to know your costs, know your margins, have a profit goal. And if it's available, you probably better take it because it might not be there in a couple of days. So you mentioned, uh, swinging for the fences, striking out, hitting home runs. Uh, what, what changed between then and now? I mean, what, what's different? How, <laughs> how have you, what, what opened you up to a, a different way of, of doing things? Well, I kept reading the kept reading the book, and the turtle won every time. The, <laughs> the, the rabbit got plenty of exercise, but he just didn't he just didn't win. So, you know, uh, I guess when I went to ranching for profit back in 2013, I think it was or 14, it gave me a whole new set of tools that uh, could break this economic analysis down in short order. And you know, I just thought that's how life was. You know, you talk to other people in agriculture, and they're like, "Oh yeah, well." we only make money every third year, but man, when we make it, we make a lot. (laughs) And I just decided that wasn't for me. I want to make, try to make money every time, you know, got a family to feed and, and the bank to support got payments to make. (laughs) So, you know, why, why would we set out with a chance of losing money? There's always risk, but let's do everything we can to get rid of that risk because it's just not much fun when, when you're on the wrong side of it at all. And like I said, we, we obviously have risk out there, but we try to do everything we can to, to, uh, mitigate that risk and, and to hopefully ensure that we're going to have a profit and, and be in a good place to, to go on the next year. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, but I want to make sure that I haven't left anything major on the table as far as marketing, grazing, uh, any of those things that you were thinking about that you really wanted to, to make sure got said today. Okay. No, I I think I'm pretty good. I was looking through my notes here. We're, I think I've got most of them scratched off. Okay. Uh, Logan Pribino says uh, a common practice in many areas is to stock every year at a drought level. Is that a good practice in your area? You know, I don't I don't think so because you know if if you look at rainfall patterns, we're rarely right at normal, and that's. Uh, so how much, you know, you get the year, like a lot of our friends last year that had 30 inches of moisture and they were stocked normal. They were probably understocked by mm. 50%. You know, how much money were they leaving on the table? If you, if you normally graze 100,000 days, but you could graze 150,000 days, that's, that's a lot of cash. And you might, you might need that cash this year when you're at 70% of normal, you know, so I'm. I like to try to roll with it. And the other side is in, in, uh, you know, out here in this, in this drier climate, we can, we can store feed on top of the ground for a long time. You know, nine months, a year is not a big deal. I, I understand mm-hmm. if you're in a, if you're in a wet environment, you kind of have a window of maybe three weeks or two months to, to graze that off. And that's pretty hard, but I don't see why out in this neck of the woods, you can't add cattle or just graze longer into the season or, or whatever to, to go ahead and use that extra forage if you're if you're happy with the ecology you know sometimes yeah it just needs the rest but but i i think uh stocking stocking normal every year for normal rainfall is a great idea because my experience has been the people that understock worrying about the drought they're only right about 10 to 15 percent of the time Hmm. you know yep it's going to get dry and sure enough, every 10th year, it gets dry. <laughs> but what did you leave on the table the other 
hmm. eight, eight or nine years. Yep. And, you know, if you have a class of livestock that can easily go to town, you capture that nine years out of 10 and the 10th year, they just go to town. I would think you'd be way ahead, hmm. way ahead. Well, last two questions. Uh, first one from Shannon Sims. Where can I learn to perform a rain dance? <laughs> Talk, talking to the wrong guy here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the most, I honestly think this is the most important question I've asked you uh, during this whole thing. And this is not sarcasm, even though that is uh, one of my love languages. Um, you know, what's your stress or mental health provision? In 2012, I was a wreck, probably as close as I've come to getting getting divorced in the 22 years of wedded bliss. Hmm. Uh, I was a wreck, worried all the time. Did we do the right thing? This and that. You know, when we sat down last year and made that plan, you know, we had buy-in from everybody. It was everybody's plan. It wasn't my plan. It wasn't, hmm. you know, my wife's plan. It was, it was the ranch's plan and we all had buy-in. So it was our plan. And everybody could live with it because we all had input. We all had had uh, we had ownership in it. And our stress level this summer is practically non-existent. So that's and that's almost priceless because when you're when you're up against it, it's it's not a lot of fun. It's pretty rough. There's a lot of uncertainties, and then there's a lot of a lot of remorse. Uh, just the other day, I wrote down on the board in the office. Depression is in the past and anxiety is in the future. So live for today. If you got a good plan, you know what you're going to be doing today and it gets rid of the depression and the anxiety. So, hmm. you know, I would say my stress level is about 10% of what it was eight years ago when we had a major drought. Hmm. So, hmm. and, and any, any kind of, uh, well, I, yeah, any kind of, I don't know, what do you do other than the plan? What are, what are the things that help you, uh, manage it? Do you get away? Do you stick around? What do you, what do you do? I, I think one of the biggest things to do is, is, uh, go visit somewhere that looks worse than you. So even if you got to go to the Sworn desert, go for it because you'll get home and, and it's not quite as bad as you remembered it when you left, Yeah, you know, and, and we're all, I think we're all kind of wired this way that the best ranches are within 10 miles of our house just because we're, <laughs> We like, we like where we're at and you go drive somewhere else and look around and think, boy, these guys got it kind of rough or this isn't that good. And then you get back home and you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's why we liked it here. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's pretty dry, but shoot, I wouldn't live over there. Them guys got it really bad. Hmm. So, you know, I, I think just getting away from it and if I can get away for a week or two. Why not? You know, yep. is anybody going to care in a hundred years if you took two weeks off? Probably not. <laughs> uh, if it's dry out, your hay isn't, if you're putting up hay, it isn't going to get rained on. So what difference does it make? Yep. I think you just need to step aside from the situation and, and uh, go do something different for a little bit and come back with a fresh set of eyes and a little bit of renewed energy. Yeah. And that stress and mental health provision question comes from Brian Alexander and he is in a drought right now. And uh, right. He, he told me, my dad always said, when you've done everything you can, go on vacation. And uh, yep. in, in speaking about a drought, and that's what Brian's doing right now. He's got his Jeep out in Colorado, from what I understand. And so, uh, you know, it's it's uh, an opportunity, I think, uh, kind of like what you're saying, you know, when you've got a good plan in place, it frees you up from stress and it gives you the opportunity to get away for a while. And everybody who's still there can know what needs done because the plan's in place. Right. No, it's a fantastic deal. Good. So, and, you know, it just gets you a new perspective and lets you breathe for a little bit because, you know, you, you have a blizzard come along and it, it's a war, it's a battle. You're losing livestock and this and that. And, Three weeks or a month later, the grass is green, and you can't really even remember for sure how many calves died in the snowbank. <laughs> but when it doesn't rain, it is all day, all night, 24-7, 365. That's all all you see, all you can think about, and it just never quits. So, you know, that's that's the difference. You know, Mother Nature's going to Mother Nature's gonna take her share one way or another. It's just uh, what you do about it and how you deal with it. And, you know... A drought is definitely in my circle of concern. I mean, it is really in my circle of concern, 
but it's so far out my circle of influence. There's nothing I can do about it. Hmm. You know, there's the only thing I can control is how I react or plan ahead for it. That's all I can do. I can't hmm. make it rain. So, hmm. but I can sure adjust my stocking rate. I can sure take a vacation and I can sure make sure the animals we got left on the place are, are uh, taken care of and on the right path. So. Hmm. Very good. Very good. Uh, Ryan, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me. You bet. Happy to happy to visit with you. And I look forward to uh, meeting you at uh, the regenerative grazing workshop at at Derek Schwanebeck's place in uh, the towards the end of August. Absolutely, I can't wait. It's gonna be a good time. Lots of information. And as I said, good stuff there uh, with Ryan. Well, we made it. Uh, to episode 149 that means next up is episode 150 and uh, I've given some hints probably said out loud uh, at some point in a in a past episode who that guest is uh, but he is has been on the show he said something when he was on the show that piqued my interest and so if you want to call in leave a voicemail with your guesses about who that is and what the topic is I will uh, maybe even take those as suggestions, obviously, but I'll I'll maybe play a couple of those uh, guesses. So 605-549-5401, 605-549-5401. You can leave a voicemail there and uh, let me know who you think the guest is and, and, and uh, and what the topic is, and then I'll play some of those after the interview with that special return guest for episode 150 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.